Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I am your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today we'll be speaking with Dr. Josiah Zayner, a former NASA scientist who is now the founder and CEO of The Odin. The Odin is a controversial company that provides educational courses and sells DIY gene editing kits for everything from bacteria to frogs and soon plans to offer kits for the DIY modification of human cells. While not designed or sold for this purpose, these kits can and have been used in attempted genetic modification of living humans, and in 2017, Josiah became the first known human to attempt to modify themselves using CRISPR gene editing technology. We discuss his experiments in human augmentation, bodily autonomy, the healthcare industry, and so much more. In addition to his work with the Odin, Josiah hosts the annual Biohack the Planet conference, which will be held in Las Vegas from August 31st to September 1st, 2019. Speakers include Dr. Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Research Foundation, Hamilton Morris of the Vice series Hamilton's Pharmacopeia, magician and biohacker Anastasia Sin, and many more, including yours truly. If you're listening to this before the event, tickets are on sale now, and you can visit our website to find out more. As always, show notes and links are available at futuregrind.org. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support, or you can purchase some of our newly released products at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Because of you, this is Future Grind. All right, and now we are here with Josiah. Josiah, thanks for joining us. Hey, how's it going? So I wanted to make something clear right away, and that's that I do not feel that someone should necessarily need to have a PhD or need to have some arbitrary level of formal training in science or be considered a, quote, scientist to experiment and learn with the tools of science. I don't feel that there's anything wrong with someone being self-taught or treating science as a hobby rather than a career. However, many people understandably like to hear from authorities on subjects, and if they are getting information from someone, they want to know that they are a trustworthy source. One of the most common filters, although not entirely accurate, that people use are the credentials of an individual. Having a PhD or having worked for a respected institution still carries a lot of weight in society, and you check both of those boxes. You earned a PhD in biophysics from the University of Chicago in 2013 and spent two years as a researcher at NASA. But I feel like much of the media portrayal of your work tends to downplay this. You're often portrayed as a rogue person working alone in a garage rather than someone who has the training and credentials that you do and works with the staff and experts that you do. So let's focus on that right now. Yeah, so uh, I I think... um... Once you get in the position that I'm in and you've worked with media enough, you you really understand how bullshit it all is and uh, just how there's so much fake and misleading news out there. Um, when people are reading it, you know, they, they usually choose their journalist or, you know, rag of choice and decide to stand by it with extreme faith. But, you know... I, Talking to almost every journalistic organization in the world, at least all the major ones, I will tell you that they're all full of shit, all of them. And uh, that's why they try to mislead, even with stories about me and, you know, try to pretend like I'm just some crazy dude. But that's cool, you know. I I like to play into it because uh, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes entire sense. And I ha- I do have some outlets that, you know, for me, when I get media attention that I do not speak with anymore because I've seen their coverage of either me or people that I know in the community that I see to be flat out wrong and being built on sensationalism or clickbait or driving an ideological narrative that just is not accurate. And I think a lot of people need to be more careful of that uh, and what, they, what news they consume and what they believe. 
Yeah, you know, like, all I really care about is that people give me my fair say. And so, you know, I know everybody is going to be misleading and everybody's going to try to write a story, right? Because it's it's a lot more exciting if you tell a story of some guy who's, like, working in his garage trying to, like, take over the world than it is, is like, some guy who's trying to sell people educational kits around molecular biology. I get that. The problem for me is when they don't even give me my fair say and when instead they just try to take my words and, uh, you know, like twist them and, and, and make it seem like it's I, I am something that I'm totally not. But, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff out there is generally true. I am crazy. I do like to drink whiskey and uh, I don't mind taking risks. Well, that's why I'm very excited to have you on the Future Grind podcast, because this will be a long form interview in which you do get to speak for yourself and you won't be cut out of context in any way. So this is a time that I think that it's going to be great to get a lot of that out there. Um, so what is your educational background and how did you end up going to NASA and what happened there? Yeah, so even though it seems like my educational background is really great, it's, you know, it, it just I got really lucky to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I was a terrible student in high school. Uh, you know, didn't do, didn't do really well. Probably was in the bottom, I don't know, 10% or something of my class, maybe a little, maybe bottom 25%. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had really no plans of going to college. Eventually I started going to community college and from there, I got a bachelor's degree at, a, a, you know, a, it's not a small school, Southern Illinois University, but it's a, you know, a school most people haven't heard of. It's a public school in the Southern of Illinois. Illinois is a long state. And then after that, I went and did a master's degree at Appalachian State in North Carolina. It's Appalachian, not Appalachian, in case anybody out there is, you know, wondering what I'm saying. And, uh, you know, it's a really small school, Appalachian State. It's not a school most people go for, uh, you know, post-baccalaureate degrees. Um, and then after that, I was just fortunate enough to, uh, you know, I did well in my master's program. I was fortunate enough to get accepted to University of Chicago. Otherwise, you know, my education background would be, uh, you know, uh, pretty modest. Um, but yeah, that, uh, going to university of Chicago really benefited me a lot. You know, I, when I talk to people about school, I usually tell them that like, you know, school, it sucks and it's terrible, but you know, when you get a PhD, you basically spend five years just studying something, studying science, studying molecular biology and genetics. And a lot of times it's hard to recapitulate, you know, if you, as an individual, uh, spend five years studying molecular biology and science, I'm sure you could get to the same place, but, uh, it definitely takes effort. It's not something that you can just uh, learn overnight and do overnight. So while I think education is terrible, uh, I think it, it sometimes has its advantages, but yeah, uh, after that, I, I think the academic world is totally messed up and it's, it's a terrible system and it's going to implode eventually. But uh, until then, I, I, I just decided that I would leave because there's nothing I could do in academia that I thought would you know, satisfy me or make me happy. And I went and I got a job at NASA um, doing genetic engineering, engineering organisms uh, to help build habitats on other planets and break down plastics and other compounds and things like that. Uh, and then I started my company, The Odin, and that's where I am today. Yeah. So what happened while at NASA and what made you decide to leave that and instead work for yourself? Well, I mean, most people don't know that NASA is still part of the government, right? And there's so much bureaucracy there. It's crazy. Um, it's just, it's, it's not, it's an enjoyable place to work if you don't want to do work. And I'm not saying like, oh, I want to work so hard and all that bullshit. Uh, that's not it. It's just like nothing can ever get done because nobody wants to do work, right? 
So like, it's, it's not just like how hard you work. You have to understand that like to get stuff done in an organization, other people have to also want to do work. Otherwise it just takes forever, right? You get bureaucracy to death and, uh, it's terrible. You know, you, you just have to file paperwork for everything and you have to wait till somebody approves that paperwork. Right. And sometimes it'll take forever. And so it's just like you end up getting stuck in this limbo where you really can't do anything, but you know, you're trying to utilize the resources that they've given you. And it's just like, ah, uh, yeah. So as you can imagine, I was just like, you know, if, if I would have got a job at NASA, like maybe in my 40s or 50s, I probably would have stayed there because it'd be a nice, chill job, relax and enjoy stuff. But, uh, you know, in my early 30s, it was just kind of like, eh, this is like not the thing I'm, I'm interested in or looking for. So you mentioned that you started the Odin. What is that? And how did you get the idea to focus on that? The Odin, we are a biotech education company. We're trying to teach people how to do genetic engineering, molecular biology, all biotech stuff at home. And hopefully people can utilize it to build stuff or further their career or things like that. It actually started because uh, myself and a bunch of other people, we were genetic biohackers. Uh, we uh, you know, did a lot of genetics and genetic engineering research at home. And there wasn't like any centralized place to get stuff. So if you wanted to get like some antibiotics, you know, you'd order them from here, Alibaba or something. And if you wanted to get a pipette, you buy it off of eBay. And if you wanted to get some micro centrifuge tubes, you buy it off of Amazon. And like, not every place had all the things you needed. And so it became this, like you spent half of your time just trying to find the stuff you needed. And so I thought, well, it'd be great if there's just like a centralized location where people can just buy all this stuff. So, uh, you know, when I was working at NASA, I, I just, you know, got a credit card for $2,000 and bought a bunch of shit and, uh, you know, started sending it to people on nights and weekends. And I think the first year in 2014, probably did like $3,000 in sales or something. It was crazy. So Odin, of course, is one of the principal gods in Norse mythology. But how did you choose that for your name? Where did the Odin come from? I, you know, it's, there, there's not any like crazy place the name came from. I think we were just trying, I was trying to create some name that sounded kind of cool. Um, and uh, like some place that I thought would, would have a cool name to go to. And, you know, like if you got to choose a God that you could follow, um, I mean, like Jesus is pretty cool, but like Odin is a lot cooler than Jesus, I think. Probably even Buddha, you know, like he's got a spear that is carved from like the tree of knowledge. And he's got like two wolves and two ravens. And, uh, you know, he, he's like a pretty, pretty badass God. Um, so I thought it would just be cool to, uh, you know, uh, make the company sound like that. Yeah, well, I think that the name works, so I'd say it was a good choice. So how do people use the things that you sell? What are the goals of your customers? Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask Rich Lee, he's probably trying to crisper himself. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh. Most people just use them as educational tools to learn how to do genetic engineering and molecular biology and stuff. Uh, the stuff we sell is pretty mundane in general. It's like selling somebody a, a computer, or like a stick of RAM or a hard drive, you know? Those things are, aren't themselves, like, groundbreaking, but what people use them for can be, right? And so a lot of it's just education right now, people learning how to do genetic engineering and molecular biology and trying to do, you know, some independent research on their own. Yeah, you mentioned Rich Lee there, and I have had him on this podcast before, and he did talk about his genetic engineering work, which he does do with supplies from the Odin, so I can definitely verify that. <laughs> And you have done some of that yourself. You first came to wide public attention in October of 2017 after you publicly injected yourself with DNA meant to modify myostatin 
a gene responsible for muscle growth, during your talk at a synthetic biology conference in San Francisco. So essentially, you performed a public genetic experiment to modify your own DNA using CRISPR. What made you want to do this, and what has that been like? See, it is it is a little bit known, but not well known, that uh, I actually came to widespread public attention when I did a, a DIY microbiome transplant, and I basically you know, ate somebody else's shit. Um, there's like a, a documentary about it that's really cool called gut hack and you sh people should check it out if they ha haven't seen it but the reason i did the CRISPR experiment was because i didn't want to be known for the rest of my life as the guy who ate shit you know so i felt like i needed to one-up that and do something even crazier um not really uh no so uh <laughs> Obviously, something like doing a public genetic experiment on yourself, it's 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 not like there's one thing that that causes you to do it. And it's a lot more nuanced than like you could ever really describe to people. You know, people just like to say a lot of articles came out and they were like, oh, this guy is trying to modify his muscles. One person even said I was toxically masculine. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> What is it? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I, I don't even want my muscles to get bigger. Like, I don't give a shit. Uh, I, yeah, I've never heard anybody describe me as toxically masculine. So I was a bit hurt by that. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I, I have heard it said that this was the first time that a human tried to use CRISPR to modify themselves. To the best of your knowledge, is that accurate? Oh, yeah, 100%. I don't think anybody has, uh, well, I, I think maybe Rich Lee and you know, some other people, but I don't think uh, anybody has sense either, um, which is interesting. Have you had any further experimentation with this? And, and what have the results been? Any noticeable negative consequences? No. So, yeah, getting back to like why I did it, you know, at the time, and I still suffer from it now, is that like people have a hard time listening and believing what I say. And a lot of that is because, like, our education around genetics, DNA, you know, genetic engineering is minuscule and terrible. And usually when I tell people th these things like, oh, you could create a gene therapy for, you know, a few hundred dollars or something like that, like, a lot of people just don't believe me. A lot of people don't think it's real. And, uh, Especially 2017 was probably like around peak CRISPR hype. And it's died down a bit since then. But that was like peak CRISPR hype. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, you know, CRISPR and all this stuff. And it's so helpful and useful. And I was like, you know, CRISPR, number one, I don't think it's the most helpful thing. Uh, you know, you, you usually don't want to change a gene in the genome. Because usually if there's a defective gene, you can just replace it, right? Like. Wouldn't you rather just replace, put in a new copy in your cell instead of like editing the genes of your of, the, of your cell like permanently? That doesn't really make much sense. And so, uh, you know, I was like, well, this CRISPR thing, you can anybody. It's so simple. Anybody can, you know, design a CRISPR gene therapy or use CRISPR for genetic engineering. But nobody's doing it. Nobody's using it. Nothing's going on with it. And this was kind of like my uh, fuck you to everybody, where I was just like, fuck the drug companies, fuck the journalists, fuck everybody who's trying to hype this shit. Like, look, it's easy. If we could do crazy shit with it, people would be doing crazy shit with it, right? And it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So what's the next step? Do we have people genetically modify themselves? I don't know, but what's the next step? But it's totally possible. So I just wanted to show people that in a public way, like, look, this is possible. And it's not harmful. And it's not all these things. We shouldn't be afraid of it. What's holding it back? And I still don't know that question. I mean, obviously, you could be like regulation and all this other stuff. But like, the industry is just the pharma industry is just in such a sad and miserable place. But yeah, I didn't, you know, there's, you can watch on my YouTube channel. I did a live stream of it because, you know, like I said, it was just kind of like my fuck you. And in the live stream, I, I say something like, you know, I don't expect this to do it, do anything. I, I didn't really expect it to do much. 
I wasn't injecting a ton of DNA, and it was my first time injecting something like this. Nobody had ever done anything like that. It was difficult to evaluate, you know, like how much I should inject, how much effect it would have, if there was something that would be able to measure or not. I did afterward extract my DNA and look for uh, look for changes. People use this method. I think it used to be called Tied, and I think now everybody's changing the name to other stuff. Um, where you can do sequencing or you can do restriction digest or something like that and look for mismatched DNA um, based on the modified changes made through CRISPR. And the results were just really ugly. It was showing that my normal DNA had differences, not in, even including, you know, uh, DNA from biopsy muscle site. So it was just like, I don't really care about the results anymore. And uh, I, I didn't do any more experiments because I did, you know, the point for me wasn't to get bigger muscles. That was never my goal. My goal was to have a commentary on the state of genetic engineering, biotech and pharmaceutical companies, and all this other bullshit. And it just got blown out of proportion by all the media and everything like that. Like, m probably the majority of articles that you read, none of them talk to me. They're just, you know, straight up giving their own commentary on everything. So everybody who thinks they understand why I did it or, you know, what's going on, they're probably misinformed yeah well let's talk specifically about one of those articles now in february of 2018 just four months after you publicly conducted that crispr genetic experiment on yourself an article was published by the atlantic with the headline a biohacker regrets publicly injecting himself with crispr referring to you and reading the article though the word regret is not mentioned so do you feel that this headline is accurate and now nearing two years later how do you look back on what you did? You know, Sarah, I think it was written by Sarah Zhang. Yeah, Zang, that's correct, or, yes. Or however you pronounce her last name. She's a great person, and I don't think she meant anything wrong with it. Uh, uh, the, the story of that article is she actually called me to comment on, I don't know, I think Aaron Trawick just did an injection or something like that. And she called me to comment on that, and... Uh, we talked for like an hour and you know, like two days later, she's like, Oh, I really like that interview. I'm just going to publish that as a story instead of using your comment in a story that I'm writing. And I was like, uh, I don't really remember everything I said. And I wasn't going into it thinking it was a story about me, you know? So obviously my interaction is going to be totally different. And, uh, that's what happened. I, I like didn't even, it kind of caught me by surprise. And it's true. A lot of people just read the headline of the article and they say, I, re I regret doing the injection. What I regret is that like, you have to understand, I did a lot of stuff before that injection. I did genetic engineering experiments on myself and other things. And like, you could look at my blog and my Facebook and all other things. And, uh, Nobody really cared, you know, and I was operating under the assumption that nobody would still care, right? That like I could do something and nobody would really care. And the way the media blew it up and took control of it and then other people started to be like, oh man, I could get famous if I, you know, try to genetically modify myself. And there have been a number of cases since then where people have, you know, tried to get famous by genetically modifying themselves. And uh, that's what I regret. Like, I didn't think that I would influence or, or affect people in that way. Like, I just didn't think it would happen. And, uh, yeah, no, because I think right after I did the injection, then in, like, November or something, Tristan did his first injection, which I – that was crazy. <laughs> and then in February, Aaron Trawick did an injection – Maybe somewhere in there, I think maybe in December or January, Justin Atkin ate some supposed AAV virus that he purified and said he cured his lactose intolerance. So there was like all these people who tried to do this crazy shit. And like, it was like, fuck, man, I, I did, did not expect that. Um, 
that was never my goal is to convince people to <laughs> publicly genetically modify themselves. <laughs> And I think one thing interesting there is that when you're working with myostatin for muscle growth, it's not necessarily a medical treatment. But what Tristan and Aaron and Justin were doing could arguably be said that that is practicing medicine on themselves, which I think is totally fine to do it on yourself. But which brings up another thing is you made headlines again just recently in May of 2019 when you were notified that you were under investigation for practicing medicine without a license in California after their Department of Consumer Affairs received a complaint. And you were invited to speak with investigators at a field office in June, a conversation which you agreed to participate in and also filmed and released. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for being so open and transparent about that process, especially releasing the filmed interview. Uh, I'm sure that this is going to be something that happens a lot more with people being investigated for this type of thing. And I think that you creating a transparent record of what happened and the questions that were asked can be extremely helpful for other people. Uh, but what's the results of this? You've done the interview. What happens now? Has this reached a conclusion? Uh, yeah, so it was actually pretty crazy, man, because again, like, uh, so just like one day, you know, usually I use the Odin address for my address and one day I just show up to work and I got this piece of mail and I get like a lot of random ass mail and shit. So it doesn't, I got this mail and I open it up and it says like, I'm being investigated and I'm like, what the fuck? And the thing is, you know, it's legit when they send you a piece of, uh, you know, like snail mail, <laughs> you know, because like nobody does that anymore. <laughs> and like the, a couple times, the couple times when I had some shit with Germany going on, like I also got sent, uh, you know, snail mail. And so I, I have experienced now I know that like, that's the way they contact you. Um, and I was like, what the fuck? The, the scariest part about it is that like when somebody sends you, a piece of mail like that you have like a million questions and you have nobody to ask right so you're just sitting there and you're like fuck like what does this mean what's going on and you're like trying to you know search the internet and figure out some shit and there's like no information on the internet about stuff like this so i'm just like oh fuck like what's going on god damn it like i didn't do anything i haven't done any i purposely i go out of my way like not to give people medical advice or like you know how many people have asked me to like help them with disease or myostatin injections or anything? Even on our website, we used to sell the myostatin plasmid and uh, people would order like on the website. It said like this plasmid cannot be used for injection. There's not a large enough quantity of it. It won't do anything. Don't inject yourself with it. This is not a joke. This this is just being truthful. And people would like order like. 20 vials of it and we'd cancel their order because we'd be like yeah you're obviously going to try to inject yourself with this shit and you're not using it to like do experiments or anything else and so we've gone out of our way to like try to not you know practice medicine without a license and so this like really pissed me off because there are people out there you know aaron trawick may rest in peace you know the dude was given everybody everything and like trying to cure all these diseases and saying he was curing all these diseases, people alive that I know, I won't mention their names, but they're, you know, in the community are trying to cure people with gene therapies. And, you know, it's like, why are they coming after me? And it's obvious because, you know, I'm the people see me, I'm, you know, like, one of the most prominent people in the community. And so they're just like, we'll target him because he's one of the most prominent people in the community. And uh, it took me forever to be able to get a hold of somebody and talk to them. And it was just such an arduous process. Like, I can't imagine if, you know, they were actually seriously coming after me and trying to take me down. Like, I would just have no, no recourse, nobody to talk to. I couldn't even get a copy of the uh, complaint against me because you need to be a, a member of like the medical board of California, which medical doctors are, but I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not. So even though I have a complaint against me, I couldn't get a copy of the complaints against me. It was just like a whole mess of stuff. And I was just like, this is fucked up. And uh, it was such a terrible situation. And I, and I was flying to China. 
I was going to China to teach some classes on CRISPR and other things. And so I'm flying to China, and this thing just happened, and all the press is writing about it. Mind you, none of the press is contacting me, right? <laughs> They're just writing these articles. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was a crazy experience. And I don't know where it's going. I contacted them, and I asked them, you know, what's going on? Is this case closed? Is it going to be investigated further? I haven't heard back yet, you know, so hopefully soon I'll hear back. And, you know, I think it's, it's bothered some people. I've actually had partnerships that we're trying to have with the Odin, and people were like, no, we're no longer going to partner with you because, you know, you're being investigated. Even though it has nothing to do with the Odin, it's like me being investigated and not the Odin. It's just like, ah, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, and personally, I wouldn't consider anything that I know of you doing, publicly or not, as practicing medicine without a license. So unless there are some things that I'm completely unaware of, I'd say this complaint was unsubstantiated. But you mentioned that you go out of your way to try to make it not even appear as though you're practicing medicine. Does this change anything for you going forward? Are you taking any additional steps to make that delineation in line even more clear? Yeah, you know, I mean, not really, because I think I was really clear in the beginning. You know, there are great ways to do medicine, right? Because here's the thing, you have countries, at least in the U.S., that are close by, like the Dominican Republic, which have more open, you know, medical regulatory laws. And if you truly want to do something, if you truly want to help people, I think that what somebody would do is they would go to a country like the Dominican Republic, set up an organization with scientists and medical doctors, and provide people with treatments that, you know, were legitimate and just weren't allowed in the United States, but were based on, you know, clinical trials or previous medical experiments. I don't think people should be experimented on, right? Medical treatment shouldn't be an experiment unless it's like last resort. Otherwise, there are ways in which you can do due diligence and take the time to actually, like, you know, all these treatments, like that uh, Aaron Trawick may rest in peace, and other people are, it's like, you can test these things in any sort of animal in a number of ways, and it's super easy and inexpensive. Why aren't people doing that? And I think it, it's because people don't really want to help somebody. They just want to get famous, or they just want to, like, make a name for themselves, and I, I think that's silly. It's not the correct way to go about it. So I am interested to hear your thoughts on the healthcare industry and by extension the scientific community in regards to this. Uh, to be a bit more specific, it's concerning to me that there are experimental treatments that show positive results you mentioned in animal models or in other models, but they are completely unavailable to people today who are dying and can't try these treatments. I, I see valid ethical concerns on both sides, but ultimately I think I side with bodily autonomy. And this gets into some great ethical and legal areas especially when other people are involved in offering advice or support. Do you have any thoughts on this? What can we do to be better as a society when it comes to these issues? Yeah, no, I think a lot about that. And, you know, there's, there's, I think there's two answers. One is, and I've been writing up something on this, and it's just taking me a while to put all my thoughts together and really uh, uncover what is at the bottom of this. But we really... We need to come to a conclusion what a human life is worth, right? What the value of a human life is. And once we come to that conclusion, or until we come to that conclusion, I don't think we can truly help anybody. What the problem is right now is we're so, we're so focused on protecting people from getting hurt that millions of people just die. And so... Those millions of people, their lives are essentially worth nothing to us because they're going to die anyway. And that's pretty fucked up. And I think what we need to do is we need to come to some value of what these people's lives are worth, right? This person who has cancer, what is a risky treatment worth? Because we can all say that, like, is saving a billion people worth one life? You know, there's very few people who will say that they wouldn't risk one life to save a billion people. It's just like, you know, whether it's your life or not your life, 
it would suck, but it's just like something that we would have to do as a society. You can't like let the whole world blow up for one person's life. It just doesn't work. So if if that's true, if we can actually, there is some value to a human life. Well, what about like a hundred million people? Is one person's life worth the lives of a hundred million people? Again, most people would probably say yes, right? Like a hundred million is a lot of people. And, you know, sacrificing one person for that is probably good. What about like 10 million or 1 million or 100,000 or 1,000 or 10, right? Then we start getting to the place where we have to make delineations, right? And then that's where we can start to do actual risk assessment. We can say, all right, we got this treatment and this is how risky it is. This, this treatment, you know, there's a chance it'll kill one in 10 people. Is that too risky to save X number of lives? And uh, then I think medical progress can actually be made. We're, we're not doing correct risk assessment because we don't know the value of a human life, right? Right now, it's just arbitrary. It's just like, well, we don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah, of course. Of course, we don't want anybody to get hurt. But the truth is, people are going to get hurt. Millions of people die a year in car crashes, and we're okay with it because the value of using cars and automobiles is worth more than those millions of people who die, right? So we we there is value in other systems. It's just in the medical system there isn't this value yet. And I think we need to do that. The other thing is like you have to understand that the medical system in the US is not the only medical system. And I think we get too focused on that. We get too focused on the fact that like oh, well, there's this medical system in the U.S. and China and Europe. You know, those are the big medical systems, maybe Australia. But, like, there are other countries that would probably be happy to have biotechnology companies that would be happy to have companies who want to pursue, you know, gene therapies and other stuff like that and provide them to people not in a way that's just like willy-nilly and experimenting on humans, but that's actually trying to save people's lives. They're doing experiments that are founded in, you know, science and preclinical studies. And I think that's something that people need to pursue more, especially biohackers. It's like, if you want to inject people, inject yourself, like, why are you fucking doing it in the U.S.? Like, that doesn't, it just doesn't seem smart to me. Yeah, one other note on this topic, which I think is important, is on the bodily autonomy piece, I think no one would really object to someone like you, who has background in this arena, who knows how to procure the materials and prepare the materials and inject things themselves to run self-experimentations like that. The issue comes in if you have someone who has a disease who doesn't have that background knowledge, they might be just as willing as someone like hypothetically you are to try those experimental treatments, but because they can't get the materials and they don't know how to make it and they don't know how to use it themselves, they're stuck. It would be illegal for them to pay someone else to do that and then provide it to them so they can't accurately exercise their bodily autonomy because the system isn't in place to make that possible. And I think that's one of the issues we're facing there. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, you know, I think body autonomy is this tough thing, right? Because we don't have body autonomy in like any way at all, ever, right? <laughs> and so this idea of body autonomy that we have in the U.S. is pretty jacked up. But we're like, oh, we should have body autonomy for like abortions and body autonomy for experimenting on ourselves. But really like, you know, governments are outlawing anything and everything we could put in our bodies, and everything and anything we could do to our bodies. And that's just crazy, right? So I think the body autonomy is jacked up. But there's this really cool organization that I, I found out about. They're called Women on Waves. And uh, what it is, is it's uh, these, I don't know if it's necessarily all women, but it's these people who what they do, it's a women's organization, and they come and uh, Countries where abortion is illegal or things like that, they'll come, they'll pick people up, they'll take them offshore, like far enough till they're in international waters, and then they'll give them abortion pills or give them an abortion or whatever and, uh, you know, help them out like that. You know, uh, people can argue whether they th think, uh, you know, helping somebody out with an abortion is good or not, but like 
it's a very clever way to provide, you know, sometimes necessary medical treatment to people in countries that it's illegal. And so I think this, as the world becomes globalized, this idea of like a country giving you body autonomy is going to start to become less important because there are just going to be so many ways to bypass it. It's like, Sure, you need body autonomy, but also you could probably just take this boat, you know, rent a boat, take a half hour ride on the boat out into international waters and do whatever you need to do. And I think a lot of that stuff is going to start to be more and more common and happen more and more or going to places like the Dominican Republic or so many other countries that have more, you know, who have different medical regulations. So I think the, the idea of body autonomy is going to be a lot less focused on like the laws and regulations of of the country and and more like uh how do we provide safe and responsible access to these technologies yeah i I love this conversation and i think these are very important conversations for everyone to be having and i think one of the places that these conversations often happen is at biohack the planet And this is your annual biohacker convention that brings together experts and interested people from many different disciplines to discuss everything from bio art to human implants. And this year's event will be held from August 31st to September 1st in Las Vegas, Nevada. What started this convention and what happens there? Yeah, so the first Biohack the Planet, I think it's in the four, its fourth year. Uh, it was, you know, we started in Oakland. We ran it at a community center in Oakland for the past three years. And last year we outgrew the community center. So we decided to have it in a place that uh, we could grow into and that people would enjoy visiting. Um, <laughs> and Las Vegas definitely fits those characteristics. And it's just a really cool place, you know, because I run a company and because I have, you know, academic credentials and stuff like that, I kind of bridge these two worlds of like biohacker, but also like, uh, you know, I have a lot of connections in academia and the business world and stuff like that. And I think a lot of people in the biohacking world, they don't often get access or to interact with these people. They function independently. You know, there are people like David Ishii who live in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi, and he he doesn't get to interact with other biohackers, much less other, you know, CEOs or scientists or anything like that. And uh, Biohack the Planet provides that opportunity for people to, like, get outside their bubble. Because I think one of the most dangerous things you can do in, like, biohacking or just in general is, like, build a bubble around yourself, Right. And think that like your ideas are the only way and your ideas are the truth and you're fighting for the truth and everybody else is wrong. There are a lot of ways to do things and meeting people who have been in situations similar, but, you know, from a different avenue, they can provide you with different insights. So uh, we have a bunch of awesome people coming, you know, this year, you included, you're going to be amazing and great, I'm sure. But like outside the biohacker community, right? So we have, you know, actors, we have public figures, venture capitalists, we have science, PhD scientists, right? And biohackers galore that are going to be there. We have reporters, We have people who do self-experimentation. We have people who are using biology as chefs to make better food. It's just so many different types of people that I just hope it expands what people think is possible and how people can do more, right? Break outside your bubble. That's what I constantly try to do. And I try to help people like break outside your bubble because, you know, as a biohacker too much, we get caught in this thing where you think, People think that they're like the savior of humanity and they're the only person who can save humanity, you know, when that's not really the case. And uh, you're probably going to get shut down way before you ever are able to do anything that has consequence. So figure out ways in which you can avoid getting shut down where you could do things that are more positive and have a greater impact by discussing with people who are, you know, different from you. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the types of the people that will be there. Uh, just to go into a little bit more detail on that, you've had some great speakers at this conference in the past, including previous Future Grind guests like Emil Grafstra, Rich Lee, 
Alex Perlman, and Zoltan Istvan. This year, you'll have Dr. Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Research Foundation, Hamilton Morris of the Vice Series, Hamilton's Pharmacopeia, Dr. Jessica Polka of ASAP Bio, actor David Hewlett, magician and biohacker Anastasia Sin, and many more. So is there anything particular for this year's event that you are personally looking forward to or that you think will be particularly interesting? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple. So one is there's going to be a talk uh, with Zach Weissmuller. Um, he's from Reason. He's going to moderate a panel between Rob Carlson and Mike Solana. Uh, Mike Solana, he works at Peter Thiel's Founders Fund. And uh, Rob Carlson runs Bioeconomy Capital. And they both have these very different viewpoints of like biology and politics. And uh, I think it's going to be really interesting in how they see things progressing on a social and cultural level and and what's a lot better. I'm sure it's going to be a a really great exchange. We have Misty Norris, who is super cool. I've been following her for, you know, a few years now. She runs uh, this restaurant called Petra and the Beast. And uh, basically what she did was she started doing some crazy fermentation and curing and all these awesome different experiments on food and uh, started selling it to people and created a restaurant. And she was named, uh, you know, food and wine magazine's best new chef this year, which is like, they choose 12 people in, in, in the whole U S which is uh, amazing. And uh, you know, I, I love, I mean, everybody likes food, (laughs) Um, but I'm sure she's going to have some really amazing things to say. And I think it's really cool because like, I think biohacking has to start progressing outside this world of like doing things just for like shits and giggles and press and start doing things that like are productive, you know, like starting a restaurant or or applying them to society. And I think she's a great example of that. You know, I, I think she's somebody I would consider a biohacker. And that's cool because normally she wouldn't and normally people wouldn't, but she is. She does a lot of cool biology things, uh, you know, and, and that's awesome. Uh, obviously, David Hewlett, he played Rodney McKay on Stargate. I think he's going to be awesome. Uh, <laughs> he's a great guy. I love chatting with him. I love Hamilton. Hamilton's always, Hamilton is super smart. He's one of the smartest people I know. And uh, he's super cool. Yeah. Uh, sometimes he's a bit introverted, but like, ah, gosh, he, yeah, he's super smart, especially when it comes to like the metabolic and functional activity of pharmaceuticals. Yeah. So I, altogether, I think the cool thing about the conference is we're all going to be stuck in the same hotel for, you know, two or three days. And uh, that's just the best because you just get to sit around with people that are interesting and have conversations with them. You know, if you want to talk to somebody, you'll be able to find time to go talk with Hamilton Morris or David Hewlett or Misty Norris or whoever. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, is one of the things I, that I love about Biohack the Planet is that it's a fairly intimate gathering. You know, this isn't a huge conference with thousands of attendees in mass confusion. People get to talk and get to know each other and make connections. So if you want to know what's going on at the forefront of biohacking and science and the conversation in these spaces, this is definitely the place to be at. And if you want to know what you'll be hearing about in the news for the next year or so before it even makes the news, this is the place I think to hear about those types of things before anyone else does. So I no, totally. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely suggest truth. that people come and check it out. And I will put links to the show notes at futuregrind.org for anyone who wants to buy tickets. Um, but before we wrap up here, what is next for you? What do you have brewing? Anything you're working on? Anything you'd like to announce? Oh, gosh. I'm always working on cool and crazy shit it's just like things take time to develop one of the things we're really working on hard right now is starting to make a push into diy human uh cell culture mammalian cell culture so people can culture cells at home and start doing more uh sophisticated experiments i mean we're always trying to push in that direction to help people do more sophisticated experiments and uh 
I think this is going to be awesome. It's going to be really cool, and we're getting really far with it. And hopefully within the next uh, couple months, we'll be able to offer people kits and classes on how to learn how to genetically modify human cells in their home. I think that's just going to be – it's the next step. You know, We're getting closer and closer to providing people with all the tools so that there's really no difference between like an academic lab and somebody's garage. Yeah, I, I can't wait till that comes out. And another thing we didn't even get to touch on much today was the classes the Odin offers as well. Introductions to genetics and engineering and all these different things that I think is very important that, you know, you're not only offering an alternative to doing work in research labs, but you're offering alternative to doing educational work in, in universities and such. And I think that's extremely valuable as well. So I definitely suggest anyone check those out. Look into the Odin's website. We will link to it. And I look forward to following along with the rest of your work. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, no problem. It was great to chat. Hey everyone, Ryan O'Shea again, and thanks for listening to my interview with Josiah Zayner. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. We also need your help to keep this podcast running. You can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support, or make a purchase at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Thank you.